Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're glad that you can be here to take part in this study of God's Word, the words of eternal life, the words that He uses to mold us and shape us. Amen. Yes. So I want to pray, just before we start, and just before Mark prays, uh, I want to say we're, we're continuing on in our study of First Timothy. And last week we ended, I had read verses, uh, or in chapter 5, read verses 1 and 2, but we didn't have time to discuss them, so we're going to start there today. But I do want to remind you a couple of things. Please don't let this be the entire content of the Bible study. The purpose of this is to stimulate you to spend more time in the Word, speaking to God about what you hear here. And, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will tickle your spirit and some things will just come to life. And if you make a note of them, jot them down and then have a conversation with the Lord about them. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yes. You need to hear from Him, right? Amen. That's okay. Right. But be, now... Brother Mark can start us off with a prayer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Yes. It guides our lives to your holiness and to everlasting life. And we just thank you. And with it, we can live a better life, a more profitable life, but a life for you. And spread it around to, to others. Amen. 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 Change us to serve you better and better, Lord. Amen. All right. As I said, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're going to start right at verse 5. I'm going to read verses, uh, verses 1 and 2. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. It says, do not sharply rebuke an older man. It goes on, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4.15, and talked about speaking the truth in love, okay? That's the only way we're supposed to speak. It says, if any man speaks, let him speak as a word of the utterances of God. But we are called to speak the truth in love, right? Mm -hmm. You don't hold back the truth, but when you give the truth, love had better be your motivation. Mm -hmm. Starting with the love for God, and then the love for the person you're talking to. You don't to. do it for condemnation. No, we don't. We don't do anything for condemnation. That's not our job, right? Uh, our job is to bring because the word of God is profitable for correction. That's right. I just thought of something in Go, in the book of Galatians. He said, "Oh, you foolish Galatians!" Mm -hmm. He must have really been upset at what they believed for him to say that. It's not that he was upset. He was concerned. Right. There's, there's, there's a difference, okay? Well, con okay, no, no, concerned, yeah. meaning very concerned because yeah. of what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Set well, far off. Most of the letters that Paul wrote to the churches were letters of correction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they were they were doing things wrong. Right. Um, because the Word of God is profitable for correction. But, you know, I like the way that ends in, in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's profitable for training in righteousness. Yes. Yes, that's the final goal. Well, that should be that should be our principal reason for for being here mm -hmm. is to be trained in righteousness. Okay, we have righteousness. That was a free gift of God. We have life. We have, but you know, you have to grow in that. You have to you learn have to, to learn from it, it to yeah. learn to walk in it. Yes. So Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter. Okay, mm -hmm. in chapter two, verses twenty-four and five, and he said. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And Mark had just mentioned Galatians, but let me read something else from Galatians in the sixth chapter, the first verse. He said, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. You have to re remember though, okay? 
When Barnabas, Paul, and Mark went to the island of Cyprus, mm -hmm. they'd been prayed over at Antioch, and they went to the island of Cyprus to start to proclaim the word of God. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 16, 13, verses 6 to 12. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found the magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bargesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who is also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Hmm. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. How gentle is that? Hmm. And of course there was Ananias and Sapphira, in Acts chapter 5, right? Yes. Um, who, had, who had lied to the Holy Spirit. And then there was Jesus dealing with a righteous anger when he was dealing with the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees, calling them serpents and vipers and whitewashed tombs because they were blind guides leading the people astray. And it says, shutting up the kingdom of heaven to them. Matthew 23, it's in chap chapter 23, verses 13 to 33. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, that doesn't sound gentle in any translation. That's a righteous anger. So you need to be dis able to distinguish. You see, there are brothers who are in error who need of being gently corrected. Right. Okay? <clears throat> but there are also wolves in sheep's clothing. They need to be bonked on the head and dealt with. Okay? They need rebuking. Well, they need bonking on the head. Yeah. I mean, the job of a shepherd was to protect the flock from the, from the wolves because they're not there to grow in the Lord. They're not there to hear of the Lord. They are there to destroy. To lead astray. Yeah. What does Satan come for? He comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he doesn't need to be dealt with gently. And you don't need to deal with him gently, but in faith. All right. Paul also wrote to the Romans and he said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God. That's what we've been saved from. That's what Paul wrote in Romans. We've been saved from the wrath of God. But there is the wrath of God. And there is the anger of God. Yes. And there is the fear of the Lord. And it's greatly, all of those things seem to be missing in much of the church today. Okay? They don't think God is angry. Well. There's a big billboard, and then we drive by it. Yeah, God's God not angry. Not angry. Yeah. God hates sin. Sin is an abomination to him. People who are, I mean, listen, our God is a loving God. And he is there waiting. Yes. He's calling people, come unto me, he said, right? But the fact that the people who are the enemies of God dealing to try and destroy the work of God and the things of God, like the Pharisees, you better, better be on guard and better understand that there is such a thing as the anger of God and the wrath of God. And you need to have, we all need to have a fear of the Lord. Hold him in total awe, right? Amen. All right. Let me move on to the next, next uh, couple of verses. All right. I'm going to read in 1 Timothy again, verses 3 through 7. Honor widows who are widows indeed. Let me, let me stop myself a second. Okay. Do you remember at some point, maybe last week or the week before or recently, I talked about basically what Paul is doing. He's giving in Timothy, his son in the faith, mm -hmm. instruction on what he should be doing and in teaching the rest of the body of Christ. Right. This is about the behavior of the church. And that's what we're looking here now. We're looking at what the behavior of the church, what the behavior of the body of Christ, what the behavior of you and me is supposed to be. Right. 
Honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well so that they may be above reproach. Now let me just start by saying this. You know, in, in James chapter 1, verse 27, it talks about what, what pure and undefiled religion is in the eyes of God. And it's taking care of the widows and orphans. I probably get contacted a few times every day from people in Africa, from people in India, from people in the Mideast about their care of orphans. I don't get any, I don't get any about the care of widows. Yes, right. Yeah. What happened what happened to our concern for the widows? That's a reasonable question. Yeah. yeah. It's not just the orphans, it's the widows and orphans, all right? And so Paul is dealing with that subject right now. Perhaps there were more widows back then than there are now because there are more divorces now than there were back then. That's not a widow. I know that. That's what I'm saying. Oh. That's why they're not taking care of the I widows. I see what you're saying. Because they're all Because they're already, they're already unmarried. Yeah. May God deal with that. I just, since she said that, I will tell you that in the, in the prophet Malachi, God spoke to the prophet Malachi, and he said, God hates, hates divorce. divorce. Yes. But Alice is right. There is all too much divorce. It's become commonplace mm -hmm. in the world and in the church. That, that vow that, that's made between a man and woman that God is supposed to have brought together. And he said, what God has put together, let no man put us under. We, we seem to take that much, much too lightly. Mm. Okay. The first responsibility here, though, falls to the family of the widow, yes. right? Right. And to the care of their own household. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in, in Mark 7, I'm going to read verses 11 and 13. He's talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say, given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his mother or father, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down. And you do many such things, things such as that. Love, with all its attendant fruit, all right, is supposed to radiate outwards. It's supposed to start with a man, radiate to his to his woman, his wife. Mm -hmm. From there, it radiates to his children. This is, it's like an expanding circle, right? That's the first church. Adam, Adam and the woman were a church. If you, if, if you have a right definition of a church, which is a gathering of believers. If you got a better one than that, email me at office at BibleTalk.com. The church is a gathering of believers. Adam and Eve were a church. Well, Adam and the woman, anyhow. Yes. And then that went out. It's from there it goes out to the children. And then church is nothing more than a gathering of families. Family. It keeps ex expanding, all right? We have to have that attitude that it's just our love radiating, mm -hmm. okay? And it goes outwards. So that leads us exactly to what Paul says in the next verse in 1 Timothy 5 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Those are strong words. They are strong. Well, and, and by the way, they are words that Paul spoke or wrote, moved by the Holy Spirit yeah. of God. This is God speaking through him. Yes. Right? So, but the thing is, what, he's, what Paul is saying here is the first responsibility to take care of the widows basically is their children. It's, it's the family. Yeah. That, that immediate... And I hate to say this word, natural family, okay? Because I'm sure you know, I hope that you know, there are two kinds of family, right? There, there is the family that is natural, your mommy and daddy, your brothers and sisters in the natural. The earthly family. But I am reminded by the Holy Spirit that when Jesus was called while, you know, ministering 
And they said, well, you know, your mother and brothers are outside. And he said, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? And he said, those who hear and obey his word, those are his mother, That's his brothers his and sisters. So there is that family of God, mm -hmm. which is as significant as your family in the flesh. But you can't neglect them either. No. I mean, I, I believe the first commandment with a promise it's was honor thy mother, father, and mother. Which was in Mark. Yeah. Which is in Mark? I said, but you just said in Mark. Wasn't yeah. it? Just in yes, Mark. but that's that comes from mm -hmm. God's first command right. when Moses went up the mountain. Mm -hmm. So you have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. But that, again, that responsibility radiates ours. I mean, John, in his first letter, talks about the fact that you see your brother in need. You know, this is what love is. Mm -hmm. That you deal with that, that you take care of that need. Well, that should start with your own household, right? That, that's that's what you're saying. It's interesting that the Bible deals with stuff a lot, your wealth. Well, we're going to get into that a lot. Well, may, maybe you don't want to do it now, but um, what's separated a uh, lot and Abraham? Yeah, I don't want to do that. Okay. And the, the reason is, is because it's coming up, Paul. Paul will talk about that here in First Timothy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's a, something we definitely have to cover, right? All right. So, to not take care of your own family, Paul says well, you're worse than an unbeliever. Why? Well, first of all, let me tell you something. You want to hear what words do you want to hear oh, when you come here? You want to hear "Well done, thou good and faithful servant." And w what would you say if God says, "Well, you know"? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, when I was hungry, you fed me. Yes. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to me. You say, what? When did we do that? And what you said, done? whatever you have done to the least of my brethren, you have done unto me. So the way you treat others is the way you are treating Jesus Christ. Don't be convinced of any other truth than that, because that is the truth. We have to have that heart of love, mm -hmm. that compassion of God. Not sympathy, but compassion that moves us to action. Okay. All right. We're zipping right along here now. 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 and 10. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, not less than 60 years old. Well, it's like, and, and remember, this was written 2,000 years ago. It's like, if she's younger than that, she maybe she'd be taking again. care of herself. Well, or, maybe. or she would marry again, maybe. 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 We'll deal with that. Yeah. Paul will deal with that. Mm -hmm. God will deal with that. <laughs> okay. All, all the rest is the evidence of a relationship with the Lord, okay? That's what this is all about. Yes. I'm, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. I said that before, because this is God's instruction, and it may be, you know, you need to, if you if part of this pertains to you, yeah, then, you go into it, then, then you need to get in there, and you need to have conversations with the Lord and hear directly from Him about how to deal with, this. How, how to deal with it, what, regardless of which side of the issue you're on, right? All right? But I, I will, I, I do want to leave with this, okay? Because we're going to talk still about widows a little bit. Um, but the fact is, I think that the church is is very f neglectful of taking care of widows. I, I, I really do. And I mean, I have seen this all too many times. I've seen it too many times. Um, Maybe maybe women's lib that that ungodly movement has played a part in that. I would think so. But the simple fact of the matter is, we need to have that regard for those women. But at the end of the day, it's going to be between you and the Lord, and you're going to have to answer and be responsible for what you have chosen to do. All right, let's go to verse eleven. I'm going to read from eleven to fifteen. But refuse to put younger widows on the list. For when they feel sensual desire and disregard to Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they've also, they also learn to be idle 
as they go around from house to house and not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. For some have already turned aside to follow Satan. Don't think you can't choose to walk away. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this just recently in one of the Bible studies, okay? The, the, the thing is, I mean, I know that in our culture today, Paul is very much held in disregard because of his what is perceived as his attitude towards mm-hmm. women. I want to first of all say this. It's not his attitude. No, this is God speaking to this him. This is God speaking to him. Yes. And if you don't understand that there is a distinction between men and women, Mm -hmm. well, you know, then the only thing I can say is you're not a Bible believer, so I I don't know how to approach. Because if the Bible, if the Word of God is profitable for correction, then you don't have a regard for the Bible. So how how can you be corrected? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you, there is a distinction between men and women. And yes, the Word of God says that the women are the weaker vessel. Yes. All right? Um. Where is the gallantry? Where is where is the grace? Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times do I see a man walk through a door and let it slam in a woman's face? I mean, I, I don't see the most common courtesies yeah. that that certainly I was schooled in when I was a child. Mm-hmm. You know, that there was a way, a proper way, an attitude to treat women. I don't see that anymore. You give up your seat so a woman could sit down. So this is one of the things that women have... They've been able to accomplish yeah. with women's live is they don't get the love and respect that they deserve and that God desires for them. They want to be independent. Well, okay. Paul, when he talks about this with the younger women, he's he's speaking of women. They're not being led by the Lord. They're being led by their own desires. Yeah. Okay. When some of them have already turned aside to follow Satan, I did want to. I did want to say something. Um, I, I, I've never had a youth ministry, but I've had the opportunity over the years to minister to many, many youthful people. To, yeah. Right, and there was a time when we lived in a not nice area in New York, mm-hmm. where the bulk of our ministry had become. I mean, this is exactly where God led us. Mm-hmm. Yes, He did. In spite of the fact that half of us. Didn't actually want to go there. No, that must have. But what a blessing it was. <laughs> because we went there, and it was like filled with joke. This was a, we were li- literally living in a, an apartment, a flat, that was on a street, a block, on a, on a fairly main street, mm-hmm. that was given away by the police. I mean, the police cars would drive by, and they'd turn and look in the other direction. And it they was like, I, because I, I had the opportunity, for better or worse, to discuss this with some of the, with the police. Yes, yeah. And it was like, okay, we give them this, and that kind of keeps it controlled. It's like we're keeping them corral. We know where they are. Well, it happened to be where God put us. Yeah. And, I mean, we had some real ministry to some very troubled teens. Yes. Uh, and we wound up having a lot of teens in our house having Bible studies through that. Mm-hmm. But one thing I found there, and in the street ministries that I had in the Times Square, mm-hmm. the old Times Square area mm-hmm. in New York, was that girls could be more vicious. I'm glad she said it. <laughs> Yeah. And that that's true. More vicious oh, yeah. than the than the than the young man. Yeah. Uh I'm just stating what I saw to be a fact, okay? I'm not saying that again for condemnation, but there is something true about that. I I vaguely remember, if you know David Wilkerson, who has mm-hmm. written so many books, the man was truly a prophet of God yes. who passed not not too long ago, maybe few five years back. few yeah. years back. And one of the books that he wrote about a prophecy that God had given him was about the rise of crime and violence in the hearts of young people. And it it was really worth note that he talked about the fact that God showed him how the women, the young girls, how vicious they would be. Well, that's proven to be the case. So, okay. We need to minister to them. We need to bring, and the only way you minister to them is not, by doing anything other than bringing them the love and the word of God. All right. Verse 16. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and and the church must not be burdened so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Well, this takes us right back to verse Mm 8. 
if anyone doesn't provide for his own. Okay, I mean, that's that's part of the responsibility that God has given us. And that's not an issue of, okay, you've got to do this. It's a matter of love. Love doesn't give as a burden. It gives because of it gives because of love. Mm. I mean, go read what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 when he talks about love. Because you can give, you can do things, but it, he says, you know, if you don't have love, it's a clanging mm. symbol. He said, you can give, you can do all this stuff. You can be persecuted, you can be killed to death, you can give away everything you have. But, but if you don't have love, based on love, it profits you nothing. nothing. You're nothing but a clanging, it Somewhere. profits you nothing. Mm-hmm. So love always has to be the motivation. And when love is the motivation, you know, it should come It should come to us because it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. What's the first fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love. love. Mm-hmm. It is. That, that should be bursting forth from us, that, that love. All right, I'm going to zoom here. I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. And we're going into another group. Yes. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. The issue here is rule well. In most common usage today, the word rule generally implies, and these are dictionary definitions, Mm -hmm. to be superior or preeminent, dominant by superiority, to hold sway over, to exercise authority, dominion, or sovereignty, to dominate, to be the most important. That's what the word, and that, you want to know something? Jesus agreed with that as far as the world, right? right. Because, and see, that can't be the case here because he clearly taught. I'm going to read Mark 10, 42 to 45. Calling them, the prophets to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slaves of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. To rule is also defined in the dictionary as coming from the Latin word regula, a straight stick, a ruler, Mm. right? That's where the word comes from, which sets a standard of measure, something like the plumb line that God showed Mm -hmm. Amos, Mm -hmm. the plumb line that uh, he placed in the hand of uh, Zerubbabel in Zechariah 4.10, because the elders... All of the people that God has placed in authority in the church who are rule well, are, they're supposed to teach and show by their example the whole correctly divided word of God. They are to be committed to feeding the sheep and be guard, on guard against feeding off the sheep. Now we're going to come back again next week and get more into that topic. <laughs> because there's so much there. And so much that is so important in this day and age. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, Lord God, that shows us the way that we are supposed to live and act, the way we're supposed to speak, the way we're supposed to walk and talk, Lord God. Lord, I pray that we would be guided by your Holy Spirit to not only hear your word, but to obey your word, to be those people who show forth your love in every place that we go to bring the knowledge of your presence into every place. Lord, we just praise you and thank you that even in our feeble human bodies, you can use us to glorify your name. We just thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Well, until next week, God bless you and goodbye. Mighty love